RPA PAL is supported by an educational grant from Amgen and we appreciate their support. Finally, be sure to check out the RPA website for upcoming webinars and events. I will now turn this over to our moderator, Dr. Belovich. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, and uh, thank you to all of you tuning in and uh, sticking it out uh, later in the afternoon on a, a June afternoon, but uh, hopefully um, uh, those of you that don't make it today will review this uh, content at a later time. Um, so as it's been mentioned so many times before in the other sessions, the importance of the American Kidney Health Initiative and how transplant fits into that profile. And, and we have a distinguished panel today to kind of really emphasize the importance of how we maximize that pipeline for kidney transplants. There's no question we've seen a flat line of, of, of deceased donors and we're trying to fill that gap with living donors. And those of you that participated in the uh, virtual Hill Day yesterday know that these are top priorities for RPA. And so with that, we're uh, blessed to have uh, John Ducker here a former board member just rotated off after two, three year terms with us. Uh, he did his residency and fellowship at Indiana University and has been in private practice with the Nephrology Associates of Northern Illinois in Fort Wayne, Indiana ever since. He serves as the medical director and the primary transplant nephrologist for Lutheran Transplant Center in Fort Wayne and has a wealth of knowledge in the area of, of, of transplant. We also blessed with uh, Bernie Fishback, uh, who did his general and transplant nephrology fellowship at, at that hotbed of uh, transplant or of, of kidney training at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville. Upon completion of his training, he uh, felt the gravitational pull to Dallas and Dallas Nephrology Associates, where he now serves as medical director for kidney and pancreas transplantation within the Baylor Scott and White healthcare system in the in the Dallas and Fort Worth area. So. With that, I turn it over to John Ducker to lead us through uh, the discussion today. Well, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Whoopsie. All right. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you all for having us. I really appreciate you allowing us to talk. Uh, we kind of divided our talk a little bit. Uh, I'm going to come from a basically a small center uh, area, and Dr. Fishbach is going to be coming for give the large center per, uh, perspective. I'm kind of going to go through the executive order, which you've already gone through 30,000 times, I think, today. And I'm going to talk a little about the CMS response, some of the legislative things that have come through. And then I'll talk a little bit about some special things that uh, really affect the small centers more so than the large centers. And then I think Dr. Fishbach is going to talk a little bit more, like I say, from a large per, uh, center perspective. He'll also talk about some of the changes in the allocation systems uh, that looks at our, and also look at our discard rates and some disparities that we've seen in the transplant world. But first of all, I was gonna talk about the executive order advancing uh, American kidney health. Uh, you just saw, Rob just talked about, it. it's been mentioned several times throughout the talk. And I just put on the slide today, just the things that really affect, that were related to transplant. This ex executive order has some very lofty goals that you, we've mentioned before. I mean, it wants to decrease the number of Americans with chronic kidney disease by 25% by 2030. And it also mentions things on how we treat it. You'd like to see 80% of people on home dialysis or a transplant by 2025 of new in series, excuse me, and it was almost double the number of transplants in 30 years. So in the executive order, he kind of, kind of talks a little bit about how he wants to do, how he envisioned it, and one, and I've kind of put the policies here, like policy two talks about the modernizing the organ recovery system, and policy five talking about how he wants to incentivize home dialysis and transplant, you know, financial ways. Um, and in section seven, it really talks a lot about our OPOs and making them perform better, looking how to make sure we, uh, the OPOs are held accountable, that we have uh, good data to look at so we can make good comparisons and bring everyone up to a higher standard. And then Section 8 also br brings into living donors, uh, which by far is, you know, when you look at donation, living donors do the best so they have better outcomes. And you know, that's the only part that's truly growing. Um, I added this slide in here because I think we're somewhat unprecedented times right now. We have an executive branch. We have administration CMS who are very uh, into kidney disease and into transplant itself. Uh, so, I, and I think we have legislative people who are actually seeing it and are really supporting us. And I put this, this quote in here just showing that, I mean, Ms. Farmer really understands that we've talked about her earlier today. But the one thing I really want to mention in here that's going to really impact that has not really been addressed, which I'll address later in my talk a little bit, 
is that she talks about an imperfect organ may be better than no organ at all. And, and truly that is where I'm coming from. I really think we need to really expand our organ donation, our organ, what we accept, and adjust how we judge ourselves and for that to really become fruition. But like I said, I think we're at a very key time right now where we've got support not only executive branch, but also regulatory wise to really impre increase our number of kidney transplants. Um, so the first thing I was gonna talk a little bit about is pay payment models. I'm kind of using the executive order as my guide, uh, guideline through my talk. But the payments, uh, we've already heard uh, what Mr. Um, earlier today talked about where they do want incentive uh, uh, renal transplant and donors. Where I don't think where someone's gonna say, hey, I wanna get $15,000 if I re uh, get, give someone, get them listed for a kidney and get a kidney. I do think it would build and so it help build processes in our office so we can actually get people uh, referred earlier and put processes in our office to make sure we take care of those patients. Because as, as they talked about earlier today, that the, the monies are paid out incrementally over three years. If you get them one through 20, one year, you get 2,500. If you get through two years, you get 5,000. Give them all three years, you get 7,500. So really incentivized to make sure we get longevity of our kidneys and which will make our kidneys last longer and decrease the need in the long run. But both model, the new models coming up um, will, will, are, sh are, bleh, are showing this for us. Sorry about that. Our next part I want to talk a little bit is about the o OPOs and organ uh, procurement organizations. As you know, we have 58 OPOs in the United States right now, serving 58 uh, different donor service areas. They're, they've always been go, uh, challenged, not challenged, but uh, set, one of their goals is to increase the number of donors and do, to be the coordinator of the donation process. There's supposed to be the act link between our donors and our recipients. And CMS has been charged with making sure they meet the conditions of coverage and, and uh, administer them. They do have basic quality and safety regulations that look at outcomes as well as process requirements, but they're all self-reported. Uh, and the last time they've really been looked at was in 2006. Some of the self-reporting has led to some ambiguity in their, in their data. And also there has been a fair, a fair amount of variety and quality of the, of the OPOs. I can say personally, we've got some that are very good that I've dealt with and some that leave something to, to be desired. But the, organ, the OPO, the proposed rule will hopefully improve all these and bring everyone closer together. They feel that they will improve the measures by making them more objective and reliable. They'll incentivize the OPOs to, to use all organs, not just uh, all viable organs will be transplanted. And hopefully by holding the OPOs to greater oversight, this will drive a higher performance. Now currently the, the OPOs are looked over by the MPSC, which is the Membership and Professional Standards Committee, which is kind of the the committee that overlooks the quality in the transplant world. They do look at the donor conversion rate and donor yield, but now they're looking at changing that a little bit and looking to the donor, the donor rate measure and the transplant rate measure. Both of these are actually the number, the donor rate measures based on the number of actual deceased donors over potential, uh, the percentage of potential, and the transplant rate is the number of transplants over uh, potential. Now this is remembering the a potential donor is defined as someone who is under age of 75, it does not have a cause of death that would preclude donations such as multi-organ system failure, sepsis, or cancer. I will say that what, the, what they're trying to get around here a little bit is that will, right now some of the donors, if it's a multi-organ, the, the OPOs will really work hard to do it, but if it's just going to donate a single organ such as a lung or a kidney, they don't work as hard. Hopefully by making the rate more, it will work, the OPOs will work harder to get the single organ and not just, and, and not just the multi-organ. It also alleviates some of the problems when some of the organs were donated, but they were donated just for research. So we really want to look at what organs were, were transplanted and not just used for research. Other things that they're also looking at is the top 20. They want all OPOs to make, make donation transplant rates to their current top 25, which will be public. There's also a flip side of the 25 rule that if an OPO falls less than the 20, in the 20, lower 25 percentile, it'll force an automatic review by the MPSC. And that way they'll improve their quality and make sure they're improving their quality. They're going to go from a, a four year review cycle to a 12, to a 12 month cycle. Now note, they've also made some other changes that I didn't put in the slide, basically looking at the OPOs, how they compete for donor, uh, donor service areas. There is a feeling that some of these donor OPOs will not be able to sustain and so they're, they're changed the qualifications 
for OPOs to, to compete for other donor service areas. Also, the comment period for this ended on the 21st of February. So we'll see what other comments come out from this. Um, CMS truly believes if the OPOs can meet the donation transplant rates, we can increase our deceased donors from 30 by 5,000, basically from 32,000 to 37,000. And all these changes will take place in 2022. Uh, living donation, we've, uh, the, he did talk a lot about living donation. And there, I'll talk about the bill here in a second, but the, uh, the Health and Resources and Service Administration has adjusted their, trying to adjust the rules for uh, living donation. This is not a new concept. It was actually started in the, with the National Organ Transplant Act of 1984, in that they actually uh, have a look, we're looked on reimbursing non medical expenses such as travel, medicines, and lodging, not as meals and lodging for, for donors. But this, uh, we're trying to re re redo these rules so to also include lost wages, child care, and elder care. Also, in the past, the, the uh, threshold was fairly high, it was fairly, you had to, be fairly, had to be fairly low before you get reimbursement. They're trying to raise that threshold somewhat so people can reimbursement. There's actually pretty decent evidence out there that this works. CMS actually pulled people who actually received money and approximately 75 percent who said that they received fund out of the, from this uh, said they would not have been able to donate if they did not receive the finances. So anything that we can do to decrease the barriers to living donation hopefully increase our rate. And I just noticed that's a uh, typo on this slide, sorry. It's not liver donors, it's live donors or living donors. Also, I, I did put this the Living Donor Act. Uh, most of us who were, whoever it was in Hill Day yesterday, we've been stomping for this yesterday, and Rob just talked about this. But this is also the legislature, uh, an act that help us with increase, decreasing the risk of, uh, not decrease, or decreasing the barriers to living donation. And this bill would decrease, or it prohibits the denial of insurance for living donors, also prohibits the increase of uh, premiums, uh, and makes it a serious health condition under FMLA and we'll change and make sure HSA, HHS um, updates some, uh, its materials to reflect these changes. So DC donors, like we said before, deceased donors have been remained fairly flat throughout all this. There are a lot of ways we could try, they like to see ways we increase these uh, number of DC donors. OPT and actually did an estimate that there are approximately 38,000 potential donors every year and we get a far fraction, we get about nine to 10,000 every year. So there's a huge number that we're not getting. Uh, and about half the adults are, are, listed in ha are listed on their driver's license as being a donor. So we've got to do a much better job of basically education and building trust with our communities, make sure they understand the importance of donation and what their options are. I think a lot of it has to do with some trust in the medical system and, and some populations, but also I think a lot to do just education we have to do a better job of getting people to, out there to understand, have the families have that hard conversation with each other so they know what the, the patients or if something bad happens to you, what, what they would like to happen, and would you be willing to be a donor? In our hospital, I even see problems at our hospital. We do transplants, we do donors, and we have a lot of people that don't truly understand. So we need to do a better job of educating our, our staff members so they can be also a voice for us. One of the things we've done in our hospital is something called an honor watch. And an honor walk is basically when we take anyone who's been uh, be a donor, we will take them uh, and line the halls with everybody in the hospital that has free time, whether physicians, environmental staff, dietary staff. I've actually had my entire board there one time where what will happen is they will take, we'll line the halls and as the donor comes through with their family, they, we honor, we just sit there and quiet and as they walk fast so they can see our respect. And I can see that's done a very good job. We've had, I've had, the families you know, they know, so as they walk through to take their loved one to the operating room. Some other things that are out there are the opt-in uh, versus opt, I mean, opt-out versus opt-in. There's some states that have tried this where on your driver's license you actually have to make a physical have to opt out of being a donor instead of opting in like most places do. Another approach is actually the presumed consent approach, which is a, quite a bit more, a little bit hard. It's, it's similar opt-in, opt-out. But it's actually going to the point that you're, you're presumed that you consented for donation no matter what, and you start the donor work before you really talk to the family. I think that one has a little ways to go before we actually get to that thing. I think our society is ready for that. 
And the other thing is the awareness drives. I think, especially in Indiana, I'm very blessed. Our OPO uh, does a very good job with awareness drives. I can go every time I go to a baseball, they're out there and people are signing up. But it all comes down, I really believe, to make sure our, we talk to our patients and our families, make sure they all understand what our wishes were, God forbid, something happened to us. One thing I did want to mention again is the Immune Expression Act, or the Comprehensive Immune Expression Drug Coverage uh, for Kidney, Kidney Patients Act, where it's not truly related to increase the number of transplants, in a way it does. I mean, if we can keep, make sure all of our patients take their medications on time, we make those organs last long and there'll be a less need. But I wonder if you weren't part of Hill Day, make sure that you contact your representative not only for this act, but also for the um, Living Donor Protection Act. Now for my last slide, just, this one is, has been a hot topic in the transplant world for a while. And it basically is looking at our quali quality metrics. Quality metrics, I mean, we all live and die by quality metrics and I'm never saying we should never, we always should strive for the best. But we've almost become a victim of our own success in transplant. We do very, very well transplant. And unfortunately, we've gotten so good that if we start having bad outcomes, we start falling on our, fall, our outcomes start going down and we start getting deemed which I don't think is truly as, was a intended consequence of the, the quality metrics. So this top uh, graph on the right hand side basically shows you the outcome of a kidney with a different KDPI. Now the KDPI is basically a judge of how good the kidney is. And in this, in this uh, measure, the lower the KDPI, the better the kidney is. The higher the KDPI, the worse the kidney is. So what happens is it's hard for centers to take a low, I mean a high KDPI kidney because it will really ding you, especially in a small, program like that I've been associated with, I can do one bad outcome will take me from a five star and two star. And that graph down the national kidney rates is very, and you can do that for every center in the United States. You can click on and see how many bars you got. And so we're very cognizant of it. And so small centers are very leery of taking a high KDPI kidney. Now there's no way I would put a high KDPI kidney in a 20 year old, but I would consider putting a high KDPI kidney in a 70 year old where I don't need 30 years of longevity of the kidney. I can, if I get five, I'm happy. So it, that's something I think the transplant world is struggling with. We've had conversations with CMS and we'll see where it ends up. But I think for a small center, even I think some of the small, larger centers have some problems with this, but especially a small center, we are not, I'm not doing transplants because of this, just for this reason, we be, have become more conservative. So that's actually all I have for my talk. So I'm gonna pass it off. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for the invite for today's lecture. Um, if everybody, hopefully everybody can hear me. I can't necessarily tell, but uh, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, maximizing the pipeline for renal allografts and we'll go into a little bit more detail regarding the uh, KDPI and organ discard rate. And you know, at the end, we'll talk a little bit about where we are now um, for, with regards to the uh, transplant community. So the first slide is, these are numbers that uh, everybody is well aware of, especially on a talk for the RPA, but the number of patients that uh, have uh, end-stage renal disease, the prevalent number of cases, this number is going up. It's not, it's not magically going down. It's not going to go down anytime soon. In addition to that, one thing that is very good with regards to uh, nephrology care is that our overall mortality has improved over the last 20 years. And so dialysis patients, even though the mortality rate is still high, uh, it has made improvement. And you can see at the bottom of this graph here uh, that the mortality rate amongst our transplant population has improved as well. So not only do we have more patients, we have patients who have this diagnosis that are living longer. Um, from a financial standpoint, this is a big deal because as we know, end-stage renal disease care and care for patients with chronic kidney disease is very expensive. In 2018, the uh, Medicare budget was just under $600 billion a year, of which $114 billion of that was spent on care for patients with CKD and end-stage renal disease. So almost 20% of the budget for Medicare is spent on our patient population, which on the one hand, it, it uh, you know our patients need this care and need this funding, but on the other hand, when it comes to government regulations, it puts a big target on the nephrology world's uh, back because uh, we're obviously a big ticket item. So 
we have to do more with less funding. They're not, we're not going to have an open checkbook when it comes to care for our patient population. When we break down the cost of that care in terms of modality, you can see here is that uh, one of the re reasons for these kidney initiatives to focus on peritoneal dialysis and transplant is, as you can see over here, total expenditures and billions of dollars on the left-hand side of your graph. Uh, obviously, hemodialysis is more expensive than peritoneal dialysis or transplant. Even with our expensive medications in the transplant realm, uh, it is still cheaper than the, the different dialysis modalities. And you can see over here on the right-hand side, uh, the, the graph shows uh, uh, costs or expenditures per patient per year. And once again, even though our, med our upfront costs for the surgery and for these medicines are expensive, overall, it tends to be much less expensive on an annual basis than uh, dialysis, either of the dialysis modalities. In 1998, so over 20 years ago, the OPTN came out with the final rule with regards to access for transplantation. One of the statements that they said or made in this uh, final rule was that neither place of residence nor place of listing shall be a major determinant of whether the patient gets a transplant or not. Contrary to that, however, the geographic disparities uh, have worsened by about 30%. Uh, and in the southeastern, just an example, southeastern United States, which has the lowest rates of transplant, has one of the heaviest burdens of end-stage renal disease. And there's a lot of factors that go into that uh, with rate of poverty, lack of health insurance, lack, lack of health education is a big, is a big part of that as well. Um, and then, as uh, John was mentioning earlier, you know, we have 58 different OPOs in uh, the different regions throughout the United States, and the performance of those uh, OPOs is extremely variable. Uh, here in Texas, we have three OPOs, and the average wait time for a blood type A uh, uh, recipient, which is A and AB, which are the uh, easiest to get transplanted, uh, is anywhere from 11 months to over five years. And so, uh, within a single state with three OPOs, you can see that there's a lot of variability in that. And this is a map showing that variability in terms of the transplant rate. And this is transplant rate per 100 dialysis, or 100 dialysis patient years. And you can see here, uh, look at the bottom. I don't think, I don't know if my mouse works as a pointer or not. Um, but you can see here down in Texas and then also in the southern, southeastern part of the United States, look at your transplant rate per, one, or per 100 dialysis patient years uh, as opposed to other parts in the country. So despite these, uh, you know, this uh, final rule over 20 years ago, uh, there's a lot of different geographic disparity uh, in the country. So nobody likes change. Change is always uncomfortable, but the reality is, is that uh, in the transplant realm of things, uh, change was long overdue. Um, and sometimes it isn't to the benefit of your individual center. And, uh, you know, I'm in Texas. There's a lot of different transplant centers here. And a lot of us didn't like the changes that came about in 2014. But the reality is, is that they were due and they needed to occur. So in 2014, uh, came out with the kidney allocation system. And the overall goals for this were to, number one, uh, increase the opportunity for transplant in specific different populations. Uh, the first of this was increasing population for the highly sensitized patients. So those are people who have a high PRA, um, and we get this obviously through pregnancy, blood transfusion, or prior organ transplant. But you had patients who had PRAs of 98, 100%, who were languishing on the transplant list for many, many years, and the new allocation system made it so that these people had a lot of priority points. If it was above 98% or higher, uh, or 96% or higher, these people got a lot of points for them. And all of a sudden, you saw these patients getting transplanted because they were getting more offers from across the country. You know, and originally in the transplant community, we kind of balked at that, thinking, hey, you know, these people are highly sensitized. They have a higher risk of, a, you know, rejection the second time around. But the reality is, and the, the models predicted that we would see this big peak, and then slowly these patients, the number of these patients getting transplanted would start to come down. And we are seeing that where initially there was this big peak and things have started to slow down and these organs are going elsewhere as well. The other one was wait time based on medical need. And so, and this was dialysis time. The idea is trying to get people off of dialysis because we know with transplant, your mortality has improved or will improve. Uh, we've seen people who are on dialysis for 11 years uh, during their evaluation process. And within a matter of a short period of time, these people get transplanted. 
The other thing was with the uh, kidney allocation in 2014 was that the top 20% of donor organs uh, were going to the top 20% of recipients that had the highest uh, expected post-transplant survival. And so uh, even though you, see, you still see it once in a while, we don't see it as much as we did where you say have, for example, the 73-year-old recipient who got, gets the 23-year-old donor. Um, and so there is still a little bit of that, but certainly uh, not as much as they're used to. And I, and I think that that's pretty reasonable within the trans transplant realm. The big one was also trying to improve racial disparities. Um, uh, the African-American population uh, here in Texas, uh, in terms of our wait list, uh, for us anyway, uh, our, our wait list is made up of 47% uh, Hispanic, 27% uh, African American, about 22% Caucasian. Uh, and so for the minority populations, uh, the, the new allocation system was really there to design to try to improve their transplant rates as well. We're seeing a little bit of it, but certainly not a big jump up, up but the trends are, are in the right direction. Not where they need to be, but they are in the right direction. But the other one was, uh, the, the, another one was try to address some of these geographic disparities. And despite this, uh, these, these disparities are still there. And then last, uh, last of this was try to improve the organ discard rate. And I put down there the UK discard rate is about 12% of all organs that are procured for transplant, whereas, and I've, I've got some uh, few more slides on this in a little bit, whereas here in the United States, our discard rate is right around 20%. Uh, in terms of uh, breaking it down even further, prior to 2014, uh, there was you, most of you are familiar with the term, uh, term expanded criteria donor, which was really based on uh, four different variables. Number one, if the donor was over 60 or if they were over 50 and had hypertension um, or uh, serum creatinine greater than 1.5 at, at, at the time of death. Whereas the new uh, donor criteria was a lot more granular. And two of these different uh, factors were what's called the don kidney donor risk index, uh, which uh, expressed the relative risk of graft failure compared to the median donor from the previous year. And one we use more common clinically is the kidney donor profile or KDPI. And it's based on 10 factors. And um, some of you may know, some may not, but those factors are age, height, weight, uh, ethnicity, whether they have hypertension, diabetes, their cause of death, their terminal creatinine, whether they have uh, hepatitis C or not, and then donor after circulatory death or what we call DCD. And what's not included in this KDPI is gender, tobacco use, or any biopsy data if it is available. And so I want to just kind of use this as an opportunity to kind of explain or show the difference is that you know, for example, if you have a 50-year-old Caucasian donor, doesn't matter male or female, uh, if they're 5 foot 11, 200 pounds, have a history of hypertension, no hep C, and the terminal creatinine is 1.5, uh, that KDPI comes out to be 57%. And what that means is that kidney uh, transplant has a 50%, 57% higher risk of graft failure than 50% of the kidneys from the previous year. Now, if you uh, put in a different variable and change that donor to a 50-year-old African-American donor, same hypertension, no, uh, no hep C, terminal creatinine is 1.5, that KDPI went from 57 to 74%. If you throw in hepatitis C into that calculation, for the, for the Caucasian uh, patient, that KDPI went to 80%. For the African-American uh, uh, donor, that KDPI went up to 91%. And the reason I bring this up is that most transplant centers across the country, if they got information from their organ bank that they got a KDPI of 91%, for years we weren't even looking at that donor. And, um, and I'll, I'll go over this in a little bit with regards to hepatitis C, but when the organ allocation system changes came about in 2014, we, uh, we weren't even being called for organs with a KDPI of 85%. So one of the things that we did change is we took that variable out and now we're getting called on all of these. And what we're finding is that there's a lot of these organs that we could potentially use. And this is just graphically showing what the expected half-life is based on uh, um, uh, KDPI score. And once again, uh, the, the important point with regards to KDPI is it's not an absolute number. There's a lot of range. And so 
Uh, what we are offering for our older uh, recipients is these uh, KDPI kidneys of 85% or higher. And what we're finding is these people can live a very normal, higher quality of life with improved mortality and ultimately be transplanted. With regards to organ discard rate, I already mentioned that um, you know we're, our discard rate is much higher than uh, um, the UK, for example. And um, this is, I put the reference down, this was a study published in KI back in 2018. This is really a, uh, an important paper, I think, for anybody interested in the transplant realm to read because what they did is it's very statistically powered with over 200, uh, almost 250, uh, over 236,000 donors. And what they did is they, they looked at why these organs were being discarded. Uh, and what they found was the most common reason was uh, bio, you know, there was different reasons, biopsy findings, poor organ function, uh, inability to locate a recipient, which, which I find hard to believe. Uh, and then there was this whole basket of other, and that's not well defined, but by and far the most common reason which, we, which centers cited as the reason for discarding the organ was biopsy findings. And so, but what we found is also is that on this graph on the right, when you break it down into bilateral kidneys being discarded versus unilateral, and the, what unilateral means for this patient population is that one of the donor organs was used and the other one was discarded. And when they went back and they looked at this in this study, they found that the sister kidney 85 to 87% of the time was working at one year, whereas the other kidney got uh, discarded. And so this is a, potentially a significant uh, source of uh, kidneys uh, that in the last, uh, you know, from 20, or 2000 to 2015, you can see down here at the bottom left-hand side, the number of unilateral kidneys uh, thrown or discarded over the course of 15 years uh, when the sister kidney was working 85 to 87 percent of the time was almost 8,000 kidneys. Well, that's a lot of kidneys. And so uh, we're looking at that more, with much more detail. When we break this down into KDPI, almost 40% uh, or almost, I'm sorry, almost 50% of kidney discard that are discarded are in with uh, KDPI in the 21 to 85% range, obviously more trending towards this uh, 80, uh, mid 80% range. And then obviously there's a higher, higher percent when the KDPI is over 85% as well. But I think more importantly is looking over here at the um, at your uh, at your map when this is this is the United States broken down into the eleven different regions, and you can see here what your odds of kidney discard are when when you are in a different region. And so I'm in region four, and if an organ is procured for twelve uh, for a transplant, there's a twelve percent higher likelihood that that kidney is going to get discarded as opposed to one of these other areas of the country where these kidneys are getting utilized. Up here in region one in the northeastern part, a kidney that's procured for transplant in the northeastern part of the United States has a 27% higher likelihood of not being discarded uh, as opposed to other parts of the country. So why is there all this variability? There's a lot of different reasons. Um, but you can see here in the southern United States where we really have a high incidence of end-stage renal care and kidney disease, uh, there's a lot of organs that are being discarded. And I think that we are obligated as a transplant community to look at this in more detail. Um, let's see here. This is broken down into KDPI. Uh, you can see here, so on the top of this with the little, the green uh, line with the X, if the KDPI uh, is greater than 85% and the, uh, tr uh, the kidney has been procured for transplant, about 60% of the time that kidney is discarded. Uh, you can see here, even after 20 2014, when we had changes to the organ allocation system, uh, those discard rates actually went up based on KDPI. And there seems to be now just a slight downward trend into the different uh, KDPIs. Um, and so, um, this is broken down um, into the different KDPI percentages. Uh, when we break it down into age, if, you're, uh, if your kidney is procured for transplant and you're 65 years of age or, or older, uh, over 60% of those kidneys are discarded. Uh, but in the range of 50 to 64, 
uh, it's a little over 30%. And so is there a little bit of leeway in those different areas where we can improve uh, the number of organs that are discarded? Certainly, there's, these are hot topics for discussion. And as John pointed out early, earlier, when uh, not only are we trying to increase the number of organs transplanted, but we're also under regulatory pressures. And when the public sees that you're a two-star or three-star center, uh, you're not uh, as op or you're not as uh, hip on trying to uh, accept a uh, higher risk kidney. So what are we doing? Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're utilizing in terms of trying to maximize renal allografts. One of the things that we're doing is we are now utilizing Hep C positive organ donors. When I ask my hepatology colleagues whether we should do it, they all say this is a no-brainer. In 2017. Uh, almost 400 kidneys were discarded just that year alone. As I mentioned earlier, these, you know, having a high or having a history of Hep C increases your KDPI a minimum of 20 points. And so, in the past, uh, this uh, this led to a lot of kidneys being discarded because it automatically threw them over that 85 percent number. But if uh, if even in 2018, so less or two years ago if a donor was hep C positive, they had almost a fourfold higher rate of discard compared to a HCB negative. Um, the other important thing here is that almost 8.5% of potential donors are hep C positive and the opioid epidemic is real. Uh, so I'll tell you that in the last year, we just within this year, we've had 20 donors that are hep C positive. Um, we are able to get a, the direct acting uh, 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 antiviral therapy and so it's safe and effective. We've seen no increased risk of acute rejection, 100% cure rate or prevention of long-term hepatitis C in our patient population that we've seen. And we, so far, we haven't had any insurance companies that have balked at, uh, at us trying to get this. This medicine is expensive. It's about $50,000 for that three months of therapy. But once again, that's cheaper than dialysis in the long run. What are we else are we doing? We're starting the conversation early. Education, education, education. You know, when you realize, uh, when we all of us realize that, you know, only 10% of the population knows they have chronic kidney disease in the early stages, even when it gets to, you know, stage four or higher, that rate go, is only at 57%. All, so almost one in two people at stage four CKD don't even know they have the disease process. So we got to get out there and educate. We are using higher KDPIs. We gotta get comfortable that our transplant patients are doing well, even though they don't have a creatinine of 1.2. I've got an example, I've got a 74 year old guy. He's got a creatinine of 2.4, he's African American. He's six foot four and weighs 250 pounds. His measured clearance is 40. His life is good. He's got good quality of life. He's off of dialysis. And, and so the idea of being comfortable with that creatinine of 2.4 for this guy, I biopsied this kitty, it looks pristine and he's doing well. So we have to kind of change our mindset that not all of our patients are gonna have creatinine of 1.2. The other thing is that we're doing is that um, we're trying to co save costs. Uh, one thing I do wanna mention is too, is maybe the KDPI, I think I'm running out of time here. Um, the K <laughs> My moderators are smiling at me right now. Um, ApoL1, you know, is it time to replace African-American ethnicity with ApoL1 uh, testing if, if it can be uh, obtained in a, a quick time frame. And so, uh, um, because as I saw, being African American increases your KDPI quite a bit, and it has led to a lot of organ discards that could otherwise be utilized. This is our pathway. Um, we are doing better. The number of overall transplants is trending up over the last four years. There was originally a dip down in terms of live donor transplant, but we're st starting to see that go up. Um, Advancing kidney health, you know, these are the big initiatives. I put this picture of McDonald's here because we have to educate our patients too. McDonald's, our rates of obesity, these types of things, we got to, if we're going to get any headway when it comes to advancing American kidney health, we really got to educate our patient population as well. So it's like John saying, we got to get out there. We got to find creative ways to educate our patient population. So I think that's it. I appreciate uh, both of these discussions and certainly stimulating lots of thoughts and conversation, but we only have a couple of minutes left to finish in. As we know, by making the results public, uh, they kind of had a negative effect on the willingness of some of the small programs to accept kidneys. What do you think, uh, both panelists, what do you think about the uh, putting the, forcing OPOs to be, become more public with their 
uh, reporting, thus having the same negative consequences. Oh, I, I personally think it's a great idea because as I mentioned earlier, in the state of Texas, we have three different OPOs and when your time to transplant is, average time to transplant is three years versus seven years within one state, there has to be more uh, granularity to that. So I think it's a great idea. And I would agree. I mean, when you, I truly believe, I mean, I'm lucky in Indiana, I've got one OPO, so and it's actually a pretty decent one, but I've had to deal with other ones. I think if everyone knows, sees everyone's data, they all, we all can work together to make everyone better and bring bar up for all of them. Appreciate it. And thank you uh, for your time and for your uh, great discussion. And I turn it back to Amy.